Amen. Thank you, worship team, so much. Children's Church is slipping out, so if you are up through third grade, I think you get to go with them. Otherwise, you get to stay with us. Amen. And I appreciate that preparation for preaching through the worship today. And music is worship and preaching is worship. Amen. That's how we look at it here. And it's good to see each of you. We had a great community group today. And uh, I am so thankful to be back after 10 months in our community group. We're kind of rebuilding ours from the ground up. Maybe that's what you're doing. But we are grateful. And if you... Uh, we want to invite you next Sunday at 845. We'll find a place for you to be. I know some of our groups that have not been meeting because of COVID will hopefully resume next week. And uh, the adult teachers are kind of uh, watching that, playing that by ear. And, uh, but you come and we'll find a place for you to, to study God's Word at 845 if you need to find a good community group. We have some. We have some great ones. And we, I'm so grateful for our group that we had back together today. Great discussion in there, by the way, challenging each of us to grow deeper in the things of God as we uh, walk with the Lord. This morning, it, I welcome you. I'm Pastor Jay. Just in case you didn't know, I'm the preaching pastor here, and it's so good to have you. You've been already spoken to, I, I believe, by Pastor Jared and Pastor, no, Pastor Stephen and Pastor uh, uh, glad in the pastoral prayer. And now it's my privilege to open God's Word and preach to you this morning. And we're going through the book of Exodus. And we have a our fourth, if you believe it or not, we're already in message number four in our study this year in the book of Exodus. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you'll turn with me in the Bible to Exodus uh, chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 15 through 22 Lord willing, this morning, Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. If you do not have a Bible, there are some Bibles in that seat row in front of you, and I know you may have to get up to go and, and get it if you don't have a Bible, uh, because the seats are kind of separated for your safety. But uh, anyway, please feel free to grab one under that seat in front of you if you need one. There are also Bibles on the Connect table. If you do not have a copy of God's Word or an ESV copy of God's Word, we encourage you to pick one up. It's our gift to you. We'd happily love for you to have that and take it and read it and study it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you got Exodus 1, say, I got it. Amen. I love to hear that. Exodus chapter 1, let's read verses 15 through 22 this morning. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shiphrah and the other Pua, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Would you bow one more time as we pray together this morning? Let's bow and pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before your holy presence today, thanking you, Father, for just a, a joyful, faith-building time of worship through music and song today. Thank you, Father, that we can gather as the people of God, men, women, and young people, filled with the Holy Spirit, join our voices together in praising you, our great God and your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, this is a tremendous privilege that you bestow upon us. There are many of our brothers and sisters around this world that must hide in secret as they gather, for they will be arrested or beaten or even killed for just gathering in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray today that you would help us to have hearts that long for you and for your word, your truth, your Holy Spirit to fill us and to indwell us. 
Father, we pray that you will be glorified in and through us as we now study your word and are transformed in our minds by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to think Christianly today. May we be better equipped as your children because of our study this morning in this time of worship. And Father, I, I come to you desperate. We have sung this and declared this in our songs and in our singing. But apart from you, Lord Jesus, I can do nothing. And so I plead, Lord, that you will abide in me and help me abide in you. I pray that you would fill me, Holy Spirit, anoint me now to think and to preach the truth that you would have me preach. And, oh, God, give us hungry, receptive hearts. Lord, help us to set our minds' attention and our hearts' affection upon you, O God, and praise you for who you are and what you have done and are doing in and through the person and work of Jesus, your Son. So be with us this morning. Work in your people. Save the lost. Oh, open eyes today. Transform hearts. Build faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, amen. You all are pretty sight to my eyes, and it's a great day here at Crawford Baptist Church as we reboot many of our community groups and continue worship of the Lord going this morning. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 to 22. I've entitled the message today, The Culture of Death and the Gospel of Christ. And I don't know about you, as we have gone through the first three messages in Exodus, it's like you have the newspaper right here. If you don't know what that is, you'll have to Google that, all right? Some of you know that, some of you don't. Uh, news feed might work. Um, but as, you, as, you re- if we, as we've studied Exodus, we just see how relevant and dynamic and powerful the Word of God is to us today. It's as fresh as if it were baked early this morning. And so we dive into this topic, the culture of death and the gospel of Christ. And I just want to just mention this. You know, we, we all question things in life, do we not? And uh, I'd originally written, have you ever had a question about something in life? And I was thinking, you know, that's really a ridiculous question because we all have questions about things in life. Like, why is this happening to me? Why my health? Why my job? Why my child? Why my family? Why my church? Why my nation? I mean, we all have these things that happen in life, and we sit back, and we, we sit and, and, and kind of scratch our chins and wonder, what in the world is going on? What is happening in my life? Now, I want you to think about where we are and where we have been these first three messages in Exodus, you know, at this point in Exodus, you know, surely the Israelites are at this point of, of wondering what in the world is going on. I mean, th- they had to be wondering, why, God, did you lead us to Egypt in the first place? And why are the Egyptians seeking to exterminate us as a people, I mean, what have we done? We've served the Pharaoh. We've worked for the Pharaoh. And now it's getting harder and harder. And now he's trying to exterminate us, kill us as a people. Why must we be oppressed by slavery for hundreds of years? And why must we live in a land where Joseph is remembered no more? Lord, Have you ever asked this question, Lord, why? Why, God, is it this way? What are you doing? It just seems to make no sense. That's where the Israelites were. That's where they were, smack dab, where we pick up our story in our sermon series this morning. They are right there just 
shrouded with darkness, not knowing what in the world is happening, what's going on, but whatever is happening, it's getting worse and not getting better. That's where they are. Now, you and I, we're blessed. You and I are blessed to have the benefit of Moses' divinely inspired explanation of God's sovereign plans. We read of that in the Bible. But the Israelites, in the midst of this suffering, had no clue. We have access in Scripture to the unfolding uh, of God's purposes for His people. We've already talked about the doctrine of providence and how that God is involved in our lives. He knows the number of hairs on your heads. He knows what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're going through. Uh, he knows every detail about you and me. The doctrine of God's providence. And God is driving and directing all things that take place to fulfill His sovereignly decreed will. That's what providence is. But you know... Part of God's providence is for us to trust Him when the lights go out. And you need to understand, you're not the only one to sit there and scratch your head and wonder and have a headache because of things going on at work or with children or with grandchildren or with the church or in your nation or whatever it might be. You're not the only one. You see, this story of Exodus, as we've already said, this is our story. The people of God in the Old Testament are our people. All right? We're one family of God, Ephesians chapter 2 teaches. And so part of God's providence is for us to trust Him when the lights are out. You see, eventually, eventually, God's people are going to be delivered from the house of bondage, from slavery in Egypt eventually but before things get better they're going to get worse in fact they're going to get much worse you see when Pharaoh realized that the captivity was doing nothing to bring the Israelites under control and that in fact that their population was growing by leaps and bounds he devised a new strategy he turned from slavery to slaughter. And he sought to usurp the rights and authority of God over life and death. And so this morning I want to speak to you on the culture of death and the gospel of Christ. And the first big idea I want you to think about, the first point this morning would be this. God knows about the spiritual battle. This is important for us to understand. God knows about the spiritual battle that they were facing. And listen, God knows the spiritual battle that you are facing this very moment. I told them in community group, we have spiritual warfare every Sunday, getting four people up, moving in the same direction, just to get them out the door so we can be at church on time. Brother, Brother Mike said, you know, it always seems to be worse on Sunday than any other day of the week. And I believe he's right. And so it's important for us to know God knows about the spiritual battle that we are encountering. Now, in our text, Pharaoh is implementing the culture of death in his kingdom. He wants every Hebrew boy, baby to be killed. And you may be sitting there wondering, okay, why? Why would he want to kill the boys? Why not kill all of them or kill the girl? Well, he needs slave labor. So he doesn't want to kill all of them. But why would he kill the boys? I think there's a clue back in chapter 1, verse 10. We saw this last week. Look in Exodus 1, 10. Pharaoh says, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So one of the thoughts in Pharaoh's wicked mind is that, you know, if we kill the boys, they can't grow up to be soldiers that one day may side against us. If an, if an army invaded us from outside of our kingdom, you know, these Jewish men can't rise up as resistance soldiers 
within our land and help them defeat us. That was one of his thoughts. Another thought would be this. If the men are eliminated, eventually the Hebrew women will have to intermarry Egyptians or other peoples that are living in Egypt, which then in turn would cause the Hebrews eventually to assimilate into Egyptian culture. Which we mentioned in a message or two ago that did not happen. But Pharaoh was thinking, you know, I'll still have a workforce, but we'll just assemble, you know, we'll get their women married off to Egyptians, and eventually this Hebrew culture thing will just fade away. And that may not sound like a big deal to you and me, but it really is. Because this would destroy the people from whom the Messiah is to come. You see, Jesus, beloved, is a Hebrew. He is a Jew. And he is descended from Adam and from Noah and from Shem and from Abraham and from Isaac and from Jacob and from Judah, the lion that we sing about, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so you see how Satan is at work here to destroy the Hebrew people because in doing so, he would destroy God's plan of redemption for his people globally. If there is no Jewish people, there will be no Jewish Savior who is the Savior of the world. And so in these verses, we see the cosmic struggle between the seed of the woman and the seed of of the serpent. Now we, we referenced this last week in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where the Lord speaking to the serpent says, And I, that's the Lord, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and between her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you will you shall bruise his heel. So we saw this, this prophecy of spiritual conflict, spiritual warfare, this spiritual battle was promised in Genesis 3.15. And as we saw last week and as we see today, we see this, this conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the servant. But here's the thing. Pharaoh is a pawn in Satan's hand. He doesn't realize it, but he's a pawn in Satan's hands. This is not merely a contest between a, 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 a powerful Near Eastern king and the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not simply the story of a king who's seeking to consolidate the control, his control over his kingdom, and then to help make his nation invulnerable to assault from a foreign power. No, no. This is a story with greater dimensions. In fact, cosmic dimensions, because this is a story about the struggle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And ultimately, it's the story of Satan's battle to thwart the purposes of God. That's what we see in our text today. And here we see the battle between the God of Israel and a so-called God of Egypt, Pharaoh. Remember, Pharaoh himself is worshipped as a god. Egypt was polytheistic. That means they worshipped many different gods. They worshipped the Nile River. They worshipped the sun. They worshipped Pharaoh. They worshipped bulls. They worshipped gnats. They worshipped frogs. All these things that we're going to see eventually as we look at the, the plagues that God pours out upon Egypt. Uh, he is judging the different things that they have elevated to the status of a god saying, Hey, I am the true God bow down, repent, and worship me. That's what God is saying in these. But I want you to look. Look, look in verse 15. 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and set them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. Now, I want you to look at this. These verses, beloved, teach us something about God. Yes, they teach us something about Pharaoh. He's evil. If you were able to see the video, one of the numbers on that video we saw from the Women's Resource Center said that 86% of women, if they have one person speak to them, 
and encourage them to think about this, pray about this, talk to somebody and get some help before you go through and abort your baby. 86% of the women, the video was stating, will not go through with the abortion. That's huge. You see, there's an evil world in place that seeks to destroy life. Same was in place in Egypt through Pharaoh's edict, his command. The male Jewish baby boys were to be slaughtered. But what do these verses teach us about God? Verses 15 and 16. Do you see it? Do you see it? See, these verses show us the omniscience of God. Dr. Wayne Grudem has defined omniscience this way in his systematic theology. God fully knows himself. And remember, God's eternal and infinite. But see, our God fully knows himself. He has infinite knowledge. God fully knows himself and all things actual and possible in one simple and eternal act. That's omniscience, according to Dr. Wayne Grudem. Now, in the Baptist faith and message, which is our official doctrinal position of the Southern Baptist Convention, and we believe this document. I'm going to give in the membership lunch and class today. I will give you a copy of this if you don't have one. This is our official doctrinal position as a cooperating church at the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, we believe everything this document says. We believe more here at this church. We don't believe less. But in chapter 2, it's so small, we'll maybe say part 2. Article 2. Article 2. Under the person of God. It says this, I'll just part of it. God is infinite in holiness in all other perfections. God is all powerful and all knowing, and his perfect knowledge extends to all things, past, present, and future, including the future decisions of his free creatures. This is our Baptist faith. So in other words, what I'm saying to you that the Bible teaches us in these two verses, the, the Bible allows us to see, hey, God knows what's in Pharaoh's evil heart. Do you see it? God knows the wickedness of Pharaoh. God knows his evil strategy to, to murder the male babies within the Hebrew people. God is aware of what Pharaoh is proposing. Listen, God is always aware of everything. He knows what videos you have deleted on your YouTube account. He knows the songs that are on your playlist on your phone. He knows what you're hiding from your parents because you have a more masterful understanding somehow of technology than your parents do. God is aware, fully aware of everything, everything. Thing. See, God knows what Pharaoh is up to. God knows about the spiritual battle raging between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Listen, the Holy Trinity never meets in emergency session. He knows all things. And so, number one, we just want to be reminded today, God knows about the spiritual battle. He knew it then, and He knows it now. And we are in one, beloved. And if you don't think we are, we need to pray and wake up. We're in a spiritual battle. Number two, I want you to see the good news. God thwarts the evil plan. This is verses 17 to 19. Verses 17 to 19, God thwarts the evil plan. Notice verse 17, big word here, but. Amen? You got to love the buts in the Bible. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. And so the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? And let the male children live. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. 
Man, this word but is very important. Here we see God in his sovereignty using these two women. By the way, their names are mentioned. Who's the Pharaoh here? We don't really know for sure. We saw that in our introductory message on uh, the book of Exodus a few weeks ago. Message number one. <laughs> we don't actually know the time period for sure. We gave two different popular dates among the scholars. And the main thing is the Exodus happened. Amen. It did. It's a historical event. We may not be able to put it in the exact you know, century, but, but it, it, it did happen. But hey, Pharaoh's not, he's not named at all in Exodus. And yet these two midwives of the Hebrew women, literally in the Hebrew it says midwives of the Hebrews in verse 15. These two women are named specifically. Shifra, which means beautiful, and Pua means splendid. But God is sovereignly at work through these two women to thwart Pharaoh's evil plan. These two women, mentioned by name, notice it in the text, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Verse 16. Two midwives confounded the power of Egypt. If you just sit back just for a moment and think about it. Two women in history fearing God more than they feared man, even the most powerful ruler in the world of their day. Two women choosing God's will over evil man's will. They stopped the evil plan of Pharaoh for a season. Wonder what if you and I truly believed and stood up if we were standing on the promises rather than simply sitting on the premises. What you reckon might God do in and through you and me if we put some teeth to what we say we believe? It's something to say la, to meditate on for a little bit. But in verses 18 and 19, you know, um, he calls the midwives in. Why have you done this and let the male children live? And the, the midwives in verse 19 said to Pharaoh, Well, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, uh, for they are vigorous, they're strong. They give birth quickly. They give birth before we get there, before we, the midwife comes to them. So the question is, in a lot of the commentary, did, did these women lie? Did these two midwives lie to Pharaoh? Did they intentionally not arrive in time? And by the way, are these the only midwives there? Probably these were the, the head women over the midwives, is what most of the commentators are going to say. Again, we don't know for sure. But did they lie? Did they just not show up in time? I mean, what, what, here's what we know. What we do know for certain is that these two women committed an act of civil disobedience. These two women committed an act of civil disobedience. Now Pharaoh gave the midwives a direct order and they disobeyed it. That's what they did. But listen to me. This is what God's people do when the laws of men contradict the laws of God. Our first allegiance is to God, and as Peter and the apostles said in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. See, there are times when Christians not only have the right, but also the responsibility to resist. Now, in our cultural context of this day, please do not hear me saying we should take up automatic weapons and storm the Capitol. I ain't saying that. I say we need to take up bigger weapons than that 
and fall on our faces and bow our knees before God and storm the, the gates of heaven before the throne of our Father in heaven and plead with Him to work in and through the leaders in this nation and the Christians in this nation and to send an awakening that historians in the future could write about and say this is the first great awakening and this was the second great awakening in the 1800s and in the 1900s it was kind of a skip there and but man man in the in the 21st century we see a mighty awakening of God that if the Lord tarries in his return to this earth which he will do on his schedule amen but but if if time elapses enough historians would write that man in the 21st century God saved millions of people in these unreached people groups that we pray for every Lord's Day and hopefully you pray for each day using your Joshua Project app on your phone or device, right? And God awakened churches in America and in Western Europe and churches in Africa and South America and in Asia have, have just been blessed. God multiplied the people of faith as he did the children of Israel down in Egyptian slavery and bondage. That is what we need to be praying for, beloved. We need to be praying for God to bless, work, and move. You see, again, let me say it again. There are times when Christians not only have the right, but also the responsibility to resist governmental authorities. We had three messages back in October on God, government, and the church. I'd refer you to our social, social media outlets on YouTube and the CrawfordBaptist.net website if you missed those three messages from Romans 13. This morning, this morning, I want you to have your bookmark in Exodus. Amen? That's probably where you have it, right? That's where we're studying. I want you to flip over to Acts chapter 4 for just a moment. Acts chapter 4 in the New Testament. Acts chapter 4 on, on this side of the cross, so to speak. Amen? Uh, Acts chapter 4. We're going to see the apostles here. You know, Peter and John got in some trouble. They were going to the temple to worship, and they saw a man who had been lame. He was over 40 years old, couldn't walk. He's crying out for alms. That means financial help. And Peter, being a Baptist preacher, said, you know, silver and gold have I none. Amen. But what I do have I give unto you. So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. We see that happen in Acts chapter 3. Well, that just put the city in a tizzy, all right? I mean, the Sanhedrin is furious that this miracle happened. They're not upset that the man got healed. They're upset because, man, they did it in the name of Jesus. And Jesus is supposedly a dead person, all right, who was crucified, buried, and then the body's been stolen. It's missing in action right now, right? It's gone. But we're still going to put our chips on the little square saying he's dead somewhere. So don't be mentioning his name because it kind of stirs up the, the populace, all right? We don't want that. So in Acts chapter 4, though, verse 13, they've been standing in front of the Hebrew Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. And Peter is speaking, and, and here's some reaction in verse 13, Acts 4, 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. Now, you've got you to picture this, okay? Um, this would be like if in university we taught in cap and gown all the time. All right, we have on our pompous attire. Um. And so we're looking down at poor, uneducated, ignorant. Peter and John were what by family trade? What were they? Fishermen. Amen. That's very good Bible knowledge there, right? They're fishermen. They hadn't been to seminary. They hadn't been to Bible school. But something about these guys is frightening to the Sanhedrin, to the Jewish leaders, because they're brave. They're bold. They don't back down. They don't cower. They're, they're not fearful as they ought to be. Man, you ought to be afraid of a, we're decreeing things here. We, we pass the laws and enforce the laws, and, and you're breaking our laws. 
shame on you, you know, kind of thing, they kind of stuck. It's just a humorous part for me of, of, the, of, of chapter 4, but look at it as it continues, verse 13. And they recognized that they'd been with Jesus. That's more important than all the theological training in all the world. The most pure theological training comes in your fellowship with Jesus and with the Father in the Word of God. And so these guys, they didn't have a degree tacked on the wall in the office, okay? Master of Divinity from, you know, Jerusalem cemetery, uh, sem- Seminary. That's what we call it, cemetery, not seminary. But they didn't have a diploma saying, you know, Master of Divinity from Jerusalem Baptist Seminary. Didn't have that. But they had been with Jesus, and that was obvious. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. In other words, what, what, what are the, what's the Sanhedrin, the educated? They have all the diplomas. They have the lineage. Their daddy had been, you know, a, a priest or a, a prophet or a member of the Sanhedrin, you know, a, a, a scribe. Uh, they have the family lineage. They have the degrees. They have the experience. And when CNN Jerusalem wants to interview someone on a religious situation and occurrence such as the resurrection, well, obviously, that would be liberal theology, and we don't believe dead men do not get up and walk again. That's our humble but most accurate opinion. I mean, that's the Sanhedrin. They got two fishermen over here. I mean, been casting nets, pulling in slimy fish. But they don't back down. And the thing is, exhibit A for them is a man whom these guys had passed going to work every day of their lives for the last bunch of years. Beside the gate, beautiful. This guy, lying out there, can't walk, crawling around, nasty, filthy, hungry, starving, flea, flea-bitten. I mean, just, 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 a, just a, a poor excuse of a human being that we have had no time for. And now, he's standing up beside criminal number one and criminal number two. And somehow he's like able to do jumping jacks and, you know, run in place for Jesus stuff. I mean, this is different. They, they have, in other words, they, they have nothing they can say. You see, your testimony is more important maybe than you think. See, as you live filled with the Holy Spirit, your testimony before a lost world, it's a powerful tool in the hands of God to open doors for you to proclaim the gospel. They're not saved by your life. They're saved by His death, and we've got to tell them about that. But you, we have to walk the talk. Amen? You know, we know a lot of people long on talk and short on lip. Amen? I mean, they're good at getting in your business, but they sure don't manage themselves spiritually very well. Well, anyway another sermon. Verse 15, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, so they put them out, they conferred with one another, saying, okay, what shall we do with these men? That's a big question. For that a notable sign, that word sign means miracle, has been performed through them, is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And notice this now, and we cannot deny it. I mean, listen, when you are addicted to drugs and alcohol and profanity comes out of your mouth just as easily as you breathe, when you beat your wife and your children and take their lunch money and then go buy alcohol or drugs or, or engage immorally with other women or whatever it may be, and then all of a sudden you come in and you say, hey, God has saved me. And people say, well, <laughs> we'll see about that. It's like some in church history have said, well, how many of uh, George Whitfield, how many folks got converted? He said, well, come back in six months and I'll tell you. You see, the proof's in the pudding. And when the Holy Spirit transforms your life, you are transformed. And that's what we have. So there's power in testimony. But they, they cannot deny the miracle that's taking place. Verse 17, but in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. It's almost like news media today being threatened or they, they, they take away your platform. Big tech does because they don't want certain ideas circulated amongst people. And remember, this is not communist China here. This is the United States of America. 
But, I mean, same idea here. Hey, we don't want this name. This name cannot be on the news. It's not to be on the radio. You're not supposed to be say it. Don't whisper the name of Jesus anymore. That's, that's where they're going with this, right? So they called them, that's the apostles, in and charged them not to speak at all in the name of Jesus. See that? Black ink on white paper. Look at verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Folks, they can take away our platform. They can kick us off Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Parlor and everything else. But if we do what God has saved us to do and to proclaim, that message will go forth. It will go forth. And so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. I mean, for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So we see here in Acts 4, we see it in Acts 5, that we must obey God rather than men. Now, Shifra and Pua had the courage to do such a beautiful, splendid thing because they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh, the most powerful leader in the world at that time. They dared to risk their lives because they feared God. Now, as we're moving on through and getting close to finishing this morning, I need you to listen carefully. I'm not saying any of this lightly. We've had too much sermon light in the last century. I'm not saying specifically you have or you haven't. I'm not, but overall, we don't say much about persecution and opposition and adversity and, and, and going to jail for standing for Christ. You just don't grow churches like that. We want the feel good, smile, get your face lift, buy your wife a Rolex watch, and God's happy with everybody. Now, you don't know who I'm imitating, do you? Probably not. So-called biggest church in America. You can get a big group by doing that. But it's certainly not a church. The question this morning is, whom will you serve? God or Pharaoh? Whom will you fear? God or Pharaoh? When in our culture you are asked or ordered to do that which is against God's word, remember that you too are part of a greater struggle. We cannot lose sight of this cosmic battle ultimately between Satan and God, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. You and I are also involved in this greater struggle. As parents, we're involved in this greater struggle. As biblical counselors, you will be involved in the greater. It's not just the man or the woman sitting across your desk coming in for biblical counseling. It's not, you know, just that friend at work going through this with their children or whatever the scenario may be that pops into your mind. No, there is a bigger cosmic struggle that is in play and it is serious. And so, brothers and sisters of all ages in this room, if you are a Christian, whom will you serve? You have to answer that question. And perhaps in God's providence, God has chosen that your faithfulness will be used to preserve His people and further His gospel. Dr. Vody Balcom has said this, you know, you can avoid persecution. All you have to do is compromise. You know, he said in a conference this weekend, the National Founders Conference down in Florida, you know, uh, you know everybody loves Jesus until you define him biblically. And then not so much. So if you want to avoid persecution, then we compromise. We don't speak out against the sins of our day and our culture. 
and we don't keep emphasizing repentance. Turn from your sin. We do not preach that just to alcoholics and drug addicts and transgender people and homosexuals. No, we preach that to all people because the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As we were discussing in community group when dealing with specific, specific sinful issues, it is it's good to remember, hey, we're all sinners. We all need God's grace and mercy. So let's none of us stick our noses up at people who are trapped in this or trapped in that because by God's grace, you're not trapped in that anymore. But no matter how fine and fancy and religious you, you think you are right now, there was a time in your life when you were a dead sinner, separated from God, a, children of, a child of wrath. No hope. Listen, everybody on this planet is without hope except for God in Christ. He's the only one. He's the only one who can make a difference. You see, we need to be courageous and bold, beloved. We need to stand on the promises and stop sitting on the premises. Listen, 63, nearly 63 million abortions in this country since 1973. We just had the 48th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which made that legal in the United States of America. We're nearing 63 million babies murdered in the mother's womb. When the, when the womb becomes a tomb, we have the culture of death in our country. We need to proclaim the gospel. We need to pray. We need to disciple others. We need to serve at the Women's Resource Center. We need to serve at Fostering Together Gulf Coast. We need to foster children, adopt children, and then support those who do. We need to promote a culture of life. And so what we see in these verses down through 19 is, is that God thwarts the evil plan of Pharaoh through the use of two women who feared him more than they feared Pharaoh. The third thing this morning, and we'll be done. You work hours all week, and it goes by so fast for me. Number three, I know not for you, but for me, it does. Number three is this, God blesses those who fear him and judges those who do not. God blesses those who fear him and judges those who do not. If you go back to Exodus with me for a moment, Exodus chapter 1 verse 20, so God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Now, uh, God had favor on the midwives. He blessed them. God dealt well with them, the Bible says. God gave them families. So, you know, you may want to debate, did they lie? Did they just intentionally not get there in time? Listen, we've already uh, ascertained that they committed an act of civil disobedience. They were ordered to murder the male babies, and they just weren't going to do it. Their tire was flat. They caught too many red lights getting there. They just, you know, couldn't get all their equipment together in time to get there to help with the birth. And if the baby killed the baby, they just, it just, they just didn't. They feared God rather than fearing man. And because they feared God, God protected them. Pharaoh could have had them killed. God protected these ladies. And God blessed them and he gave them children in their family. So a thoughtful reader may say, well, 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 well uh, uh, what about those men and women who fear God and they end up beaten, tortured, imprisoned, or killed? You see, in this situation, God delivered these two women from a very powerful man whom they had directly disobeyed. He didn't arrest them. He didn't torture them. Instead, they were free, and God blessed them and their husbands and their families, and they had children. So what about if I stand up at school, if I stand up at work, if I, and I lose my job? What if all the other kids laugh at me because I, I, I just simply... Stop for a moment, bow my head, and just honor God and thank Him for the food that He's provided for me. 
not standing on the table in the lunchroom shouting fire from heaven. I mean, just simply doing that, but there are other kids. What are you doing? You got a headache? Are you sick? Are you, you don't believe in God, do you? I mean, you know, you can be made light of. Boys and girls at school, we need to pray for our food. And more than likely at your school, they don't do that. Now, you may go to a Christian school or a private school, and, and they do. I don't know. Just because it has Christian on the name of it doesn't make it Christian. I mean, how do they integrate Christian worldview in all that they teach and do? That's what we're after here as the church and the people of God. But again, the question at hand, and I must try to answer quickly and then conclude, what about if we fear God more than we fear man, but then man bites us, man hurts us? What do we do? My, I give biblical answers, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Just maybe jot it down, listen to it. Jesus said, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10, 28. In 1 Peter 4, 19, our memory verse for this week, it's on the back of your bulletin. 1 Peter 4, 19, Peter writes, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. Please hear me. I'm listening to myself, too. As we take a biblical stand, on Christ and on the sinfulness of man and on the doctrine of salvation which Scripture teaches consistently and clearly. This world of ours will not like us. You will begin to hear things such as religious extremists and there will be the power of Satan and the world and the beast, the governing authorities, to crush the people of God. Now you say, I know that's going to happen one day. Hey, it happened then. It's happening today. It just hasn't happened in the United States as outwardly as it is beginning to. You go to Sudan. Go to South Asia, North Africa, the Middle East. Go to India. We were praying for a Hindu people group back in the late 90s. There was a missionary and his two sons coming back from a ministry conference. And some of you have heard me tell this story before. You know, and the Hindus surrounded their station wagon, beat it with clubs, doused it with gasoline, and set it on fire. And when the charred bodies were pulled from that car, you have a father who is embracing his older son, and then inside of the older son was the younger son as he tried his best to protect them from the flame. I'm not saying that's coming to America, but I'm saying we need to be walking in the day not the light. We shouldn't be surprised at anything the enemy throws at us. He's shrewd. Just as Pharaoh last week was what? Shrewd like the serpent in Genesis 3. The seed of the serpent still is at work today. He's coming against his God's people today. So let me conclude. We are all in a spiritual battle, beloved, all of us. Number two, we are all evil and sinful. We're not pointing fingers and sticking up our noses at anybody. Please don't do that. That's not how you're going to win, folks. 
Number three, remember, God blesses those who fear him and judges those who do not. But, 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 but you, just, we, we just, you just covered that, Pastor Jay, and you said that, hey, I could fear God and they could still, I could lose my job. I could lose my retirement. I, I could, you know, I, I could be beaten or killed depending on where it is and what's going on. Yes. But God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That means in the imprisonment, God is with you. It means even as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You see, no one or anything can separate you from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so I believe it's time that we in the evangelical church and at Crawford Baptist Church, we, we, we made the biblical truth clear. These are not easy days. If we, if we are deceived into thinking they are, then we are just that. We are deceived. There is a spiritual battle that's going on. We are all evil and sinful. But God does bless those who fear him and judges those who do not. So I would say to you, flee to Christ. Trust in Christ. Repent of your sins and look and cast yourselves upon Christ. Because you need good news today, and I know you do, and I do too. And the good news is that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people, and he sent his only son, God in human flesh, to bear his wrath against our sin. Just, just We look at the cross as a symbol of beauty today. It was an abject horror in that day. That would be like an electric chair hanging up there today for us. The good news, the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people. And he still sent his only son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear his wrath against our sin on the cross to show his power over sin by resurrecting Jesus from the dead. And, and, then, and for those who will turn from their sins, that's repentance, and believe in Christ, that's faith. They will be reconciled to God forever. That is the good news. The culture of death and the gospel of Christ. Would you pray with me?